The data is next week. Joining us to discuss, I'm pleased to say, always a pleasure, Mohammed Al Aaron of Queen's College, Cambridge. Mohammed, let's start there with the Fed in a few weeks' time. Are rate hikes on ice, and can CPI next week change it? So CPI next week can definitely change it. Not September, but can change the next rate hike um, at the end of October, beginning of November. John, there are bigger issues here. I think the discussion is going from whether they will hike or not to what's the overall impact of the level of interest rates. There's also now more the more, more um, discussion of how how high, not how high, how long are they going to stay there? And underneath all that, John, are some really, really challenging technical issues about monetary policy. Everything from R star to you know what are the, the real lags in play. This is a very complicated time for the Fed, and markets should not jump to conclusion too easy as to what's going to happen beyond September. Speaking to those complications, Mohammed, some contradictions in the economic data this week alone, and maybe you can help us. Jobless claims are the lows we haven't seen since February. The ISM was pretty punchy. The base book screams slow down. I've been asking all week, Mohammed. I'm sure you've heard me ask it. How much weight should I put on each data point that's coming out at the moment? What's given me a clearer story of what you think is happening? So I think the consistent story, John, is that services are strong. And they are strong in the employment, they are strong in wages, they are strong in output. And that is a very important thing to focus on. Beyond that, you have massive ambiguities. Beyond that, you have also the dependence on the rest of the world, which is in a very different place from the US. So I think the key issue is get services right. And if you get services right, you can explain much of what's going to happen going forward. But there are other issues that are going to become more important as we go deeper into 2024. What do you think those issues are, Mohammed? What's number one for you? So it's the supply side, John, um, and the way it plays out, whether it's labor negotiations, whether it's the price of oil staying so high when Chinese demand is under pressure, whether it's what's happening to Apple um, in terms of geopolitics and what does does what that does to supply chains and what does that to demand chains. You know, there's a lot of aspects, but supply is the number one. We've transitioned from a world of insufficient aggregate demand to a world of insufficient aggregate supply. And that's going to play out for not just one year, but for a number of years. We talked about crude earlier this week being at highs we haven't seen all year. Back to November, $90 on Brent. Mohammed, if we just looked at that one commodity, I'd be with you. I'd say that's just a supply story. The Saudis, Russia pulling back. But iron ore's in the mix as well at multi-month highs. We just talked about the contradictions in the U.S. data. Let's talk about the contradictions in the global story. We're told slow down in Europe. We can see it. Slow down in China. We can see it. And then I see commodities where they are, Mohammed. And I'm trying to reconcile those two things. Are those two things competing with each other for you? So once you go beyond the supply story, it becomes very specific. You can explain a lot on the supply side. You didn't mention food, but food prices have picked up again. Um, so there was a lot to be explained by the supply side. But then if you go to individual commodities, you will have other factors playing in. John, I mean, for me, there were three big surprises in the first eight months of the year. Two positive, one negative. The negative we know is China. The positive we know is the US, but also Europe was better than many expected. Going forward, China doesn't recover. Europe doesn't maintain a positive surprise. It's all about the US when it comes to global growth. Well, let's take that story, push it through FX. You know where we've got stronger dollar, eight weeks of it, eight consecutive weeks of dollar strength. Is that because the US is just so great right now or the rest of the world, Mohammed, is so bad? It's both. It's U.S. exceptionalism in absolute and relative terms. Um, that results in rate differentials. That results in flows of foreign direct investment being even more concentrated in the U.S. It, it is about all, it's all about relative and absolute U.S. exceptionalism. Well, Europe's in a dark place going into the ECB next week, Mohammed. Can you speak to me about the inflation growth mix you'd expect to see from Europe over the coming quarters? Yeah, it's tricky, John. I mean, if, if you're worried about stagflation, it's Europe and it's the UK where the threat is highest. And it's a really tough situation for the ECB. If the ECB wasn't a single mandate central bank, they probably wouldn't hike. 
I've put a 55% probability that they end up by hiking, but it's that close, John, as to whether they should hike again. Split right down the middle. There are things that Fed officials can say right now that ECB officials cannot say. We're in a good place. Mike McKee caught up with John Williams in the New York Fed. Take a listen. Right now, I think, you know, things are moving in the right direction. We've got policy in a good place, but we're going to need to continue to be data dependent, watch, watch the developments and, and assess what we need to do. Mike McKee, are we in a good place? Uh, we are in a good place. If the Fed could design where it wanted to be with its policies, this would probably be it. They don't know exactly what's going to happen, but right now they've got low unemployment and inflation that's going down. John Williams, in terms of the September meeting, put the nail in place. Lori Logan from the Dallas Fed hammered at home last night, giving a speech. And she's the most hawkish member, pretty much, of uh, the uh, Open Market Committee at this point, saying another skip could be appropriate, but caveats that with skipping does not imply stopping. So I think what you're looking at here is definitely uh, pretty much everyone in favor of skipping in September, maybe Mester and Bowman. We got the sorting hat out now that we're uh, heading into the final week before the Fed meeting and the quiet period. And you can see on the left-hand side and in the center, there's a majority who've said we can skip this time. Not everybody thinks they should skip in November, but you go on to the uh, calendar and you see what's up next week besides CPI. There's a lot of data coming in that could weigh on them, but I think Mohammed said something very smart. The CPI is probably going to affect what people think of the November meeting rather than the September meeting, in part because... Economists are pretty good at forecasting CPI, but in part because so many Fed officials have already set the market up to get through the September meeting without a move. But watch retail sales. And of course, the big question next week is going to be whether the UAW goes on strike. That would have a significant impact on the economy, probably short-lived, but uh, we'll have to see. Uh, and that is uh, the big wild card for next week, along, John, with the hurricane that may or may not come. I've seen some of that. That does not look good. My Key, thank you, sir. Looking ahead to next week. Mohammed, Mike talked about it. You mentioned it in the last five minutes. These Labour debates, unions, the Detroit Three and UAW. I've asked this question this week. I'll ask it of you, Mohammed. Do you think that's the dying gambers of a hot Labour market or maybe the story that's going to stay with us for a while? It will stay with us for a while. This is an indication that Labour has more bargaining power. It has taken decades, but Labour has restored some of its bargaining power. And you see this not just in the US, you see it elsewhere as well. And that's another supply side issue. John, can I just say something? Um, Mike McKee's interview with John Williams was excellent. His mention of what Laurie Logan said was really good, but the quote that really hit me Um, from her last night was when she came to talk about what approach she needed on monetary policy. And she said something like, we need a very calibrated approach as opposed to, quote, throwing buckets of cold water on it. And I think that that is critical going forward, is what does calibration mean? We're no longer in the phase of catch up where you made a mistake, you called it transitory and you have to rush. Now it's really back to old fashioned calibrated monetary policy. And that gets a lot more complicated. Let's get away from the last month or so Looking ahead to the next month, Mohammed, let's talk about the complications of maybe the next several years. There was a headline from our reporting on the G20 of a draft of their final communique, and it read as follows. The G20 sees a challenge to long-term growth from what they called cascading crises. And right in that moment, Mohammed, I read that headline and I thought of your book coming out, Brown Spent Salarian, A Plan to Fix a Fractured World Perma-Crisis. Mohammed, can you breathe some life into that conversation? What is it that you and Gordon Brown and Michael Spence see that maybe speaks to what the G20 are talking about this weekend. So that book originated from Zoom calls. The three of us had weekly Zoom calls. And after a while, when talking about going from crisis to crisis over a number of decades, we ask ourselves why. And basically it comes down to three issues, John. We haven't figured out a way to grow in a high, sustainable, inclusive manner. So it's about growth models. Domestic economic policy management has been lacking. That's a second issue. And global global coordination is at the lowest level that the three of us could remember for a very long time. So we asked the question the other way is if you want to get out of this notion of cascading crises or perma crises, what do you do? And we, we wrote down basically a plan to fix all three. 
Looking forward to getting my hands on the book, Mohammed. Should we finish with an easy question? Jets Bills, Monday Night Football. I had to zoom in and see the tie, the Jets tie this morning. Mohammed, what are you looking for from the team this season? I'm hoping for a good season, but I tell you, our first six games, including Mike McKee's Broncos, um, are quite tough. So fingers and toes crossed, and as I'm wearing the tie, uh, us Jets fans, us long-suffering Jets fans, Jets fans, will do whatever it takes and whatever we can to support our team. You were slightly critical about taking on Aaron Rodgers. You still feel the same way? Look, John, it's done, so we're fully behind the team now. Mohamed, thank you, sir. Good luck for the rest of the season. We'll catch up with you soon, no doubt. Mohamed Al-Aryan on a bunch of issues looking ahead to next week.